Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, oh dear. Oh no. Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome to the service. I've just had some text messages from a couple of people who seem to have fallen out with each other. They seem to have a disagreement they can't resolve. I'll text them back later on. Welcome to the service. Shall we just pray? Loving God, we thank you that we can meet again. In our own homes, uh, we come into your presence. We just pray, Lord God, that during this time that we will know you are very close to us and that you will speak into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh dear. everyone. Today's Bible story helped me think about how we are stronger together than just on our own. So I want you to imagine that this piece of paper is somebody stood on their own. Now all I did to make it was roll it up and put some sellotape down it. Now this paper on their own is not very strong. In fact, with a simple blow, it can fall over. And we can find that sometimes when we try to deal with things on our own, actually, we can't manage ourselves. We need love, help, support and care from our family and friends. So I want us to think 
about putting our family and friends into the scenario. So here, this is our family and friends. And so I am going to tape this one onto ourselves with some sellotape. So now we have our family and friends next to us, helping us, which is better than before. We're a little bit sturdier than what we were just on our own now. And actually, we can now lean and trust that our family and friends will help take care of us. But we're still not as strong as we could be. So now I want to take another one and suggest that actually, when we're struggling, not only do we call on our family and friends, but we call on our church family and ask them to help and support us. So I'm going to add our church family in now. So there we are. Now we have our church family in there as well. And so actually, we're looking a lot stronger now. But I want to think about the idea that actually we have one more person that we can always trust and rely on. And that's God. God is always with us through every situation, even when our family and friends and our church family can't be there with us. So let's add God to it. So now we are surrounded by our family and friends, our church family and God. And suddenly we are a lot stronger. We can cope with a lot more. And actually, I'm blowing now and it isn't going down anymore. In fact, actually, I could put my hand on this and I am pushing quite hard right now and it is not giving in because we are stronger together. I wonder, could you have a go at making a paper tower and make it as strong as you can manage it? Remember, where two or three are gathered, there I am with you. God recognise that we are stronger with him and other people around us. The reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 18, reading verses 15 to 20. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. The message this morning from Matthew's Gospel is about a disagreement. It seems quite harsh in the passage that we've read. It's almost like a three strikes and you're out. If someone sins against you, then you're supposed to go to them and say, and work it out with them and say, look, the, this is not right, let's work this out between us. And if, if that doesn't work, if the person doesn't see, uh, see what they've done, then you're to take along somebody else with you. And uh, together, you're to work out the disagreement with this person. If that doesn't work, then you're supposed to take the whole church along with you um, and try and come to some reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, then there's a part in other ways. 
it's a three strikes and you're out situation, which can seem quite harsh. Further down in chapter 18, Simon Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? Should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus says, no, you should forgive them 70 times seven times. It seems a different result from the passage that we've read and it can seem quite confusing. So what's going on here? Chapter 18 in Matthew's Gospel is where Jesus begins to teach his disciples what it is like to uh, follow him and to live in this kingdom um, which Jesus has been proclaiming, God's kingdom come to the world. So chapter 18 is the beginning of Jesus' teaching. How are we to be disciples in this new kingdom? In this time of COVID, there are many regulations which we've got to follow because depending on the situation we're in depends on uh, what we're supposed to do and a different regulation and how we're supposed to act. It, it, it can be quite confusing. But it's difficult for the government to legislate for every single situation we're in. Yes, we'd like clarity, but it's difficult to have every type of situation that we're going to find ourselves in legislated for. But there is an overriding principle, and that principle is that I will do my best not to pass the um, virus onto you, and that you will do your best not to pass the virus onto me. So in every situation, um, this is the principle that uh, we're, we're aiming for and trying to stick to. In a similar way, in Matthew 18, it's difficult for Jesus to legislate for every single incident that Christians are going to get themselves into. There are going to be disagreements and upsets and fights. And you've only got to read Paul's letters to realise that the early church was upset by fights and disagreements and various odd doctrines that were flying around and Paul had to write to them and, and kind of put them straight and lead them in the right direction. So we will fall out, we will have disagreements, but Jesus doesn't legislate for every situation. So the passage that we've read seems to be a, th a, a three strikes and you're out situation. But the passage later on, uh, where Simon Peter says, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus says, 70 times seven, se it seems at odds. And there seems to be an unending forgiveness going on. So what's the overriding principle here? Jesus has come to gather followers to say that the kingdom of God is here. And he comes from the standpoint that as human beings, we need a change of heart a new direction, a new motivation, a new centre point. So the overriding principle that Jesus is teaching his disciples is that they need to live with the Holy Spirit as their guide. Um, and the Holy Spirit is their new heart that's leading them forward. So that no matter what situation they come to, it's not their they're not deciding on their own, how should we act in this situation, which law applies, but they're to be led by the Spirit. And that, can be, that is kind of summed up in, in Micah 6, 8, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So sometimes there will be situations when we come into conflict and disagreement um, in the church, with our Christian friends, um, as well as friends outside in the community. But as Christians, we're asked not to take revenge. As Christians, we're asked not to hold on to those disagreements until they kind of churn us up inside. We're asked to work, to work them out, to strive to come to some peace and reconciliation to forgive and forgive and forgive, forgive. But there will be times when we come to a place when we can't reconcile ourselves with those who are in a dis disagreement with us. So we must kind of say, let's just go separate ways. But that doesn't mean that at some point in the future,
that we can't return to some kind of understanding. And why is Jesus saying this? Well, the opposite would be to create a diverse um, society, that we would always be at odds, that arguments would fester with insiders and relationships would suffer. Jesus is saying to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God, to let the Holy Spirit be your guide in these situations, to let the fact that Jesus has forgiven you your sins, that you have uh, gained freedom because Jesus has forgiven you your sins and then therefore you are to act justly to your neighbours, your family and your neighbours and those in your community. We are living in a divisive world. It's divided socially, politically, economically. And Jesus is saying that if we as Christians can love each other, even though we disagree, if we can be uh, people who reconcile and who bring unity and who bring peace and bring understanding amongst ourselves, then we can be the light and the beacon to the world and say that there is a way forward, that there is a way through this, there is a way to reconcile and bring peace. It may take time, but we'll get there. But we can't do it in our own strength. We need to do it following uh, the Holy Spirit and following Jesus. Today, if you are in a place of disagreement, then maybe you want to reflect back on Matthew 18 and on the things that Jesus says. Maybe you want to take some time and just ask God, what is your place, what is your part within this situation that you found yourself? And how are you to bring peace and to bring reconciliation and move things on, even if that means coming to an understanding to agree to disagree? and just work it out sometime, hopefully, in the future. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. Jesus calls us to lay our lives down for our friends and our enemies. And as Christians, if we can do that, we can be the light that Jesus is calling us to, to show the nations that there is a way through all this, that there is hope, that there is peace. If you find yourself in a place of disagreement this morning, then let's bring that to God in prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you call us to be peacemakers, to people who reconcile our differences. And we know that sometimes that is difficult and hard. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will rest on us and that we won't rely on our own strength and our own wisdom, but we will seek your guidance in all things. Help us to know your presence with us, Lord God, in the situation that we find ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we come together for our prayers for others. Let us pray. Eternal, ever-living God, we pray for those who this day need our prayers. We pray for those we see around us, in our homes, our family and friends near and far, strangers and communities we will never meet or know, but whose peril we hear of and see on our screens. Those whose life is ebbing away, consumed by old age, frailty, illness or neglect. Those who grieve deeply for lives and loves lost. Those who cause grief and chaos in society and who live seemingly with different values from ours. For them and their victims and their families. We pray for those who are forgotten, unnoticed, unloved, unmissed. We pray for our church congregations and community. We pray for this circuit, the Sherwood Forest Methodist Circuit, and for all who serve in this circuit. Lord, as we begin to open our church doors for worship and prayer and fellowship, keep us safe in your care and help us to know and feel your grace, your love, your healing presence. Lord God, in your abundance of mercy, hear these and all our prayers. Amen. And our blessing for today. May God bless each one of you and those whom you love. May Jesus Christ continue to show you the way to go. And may the Holy Spirit fill you, equip you and heal you. Let us all go in faith to love and to serve all whom we meet along the way. Amen. We hope the service has been a blessing to you today. If it has, click the subscribe button below and hit the notification bell. Thank you for joining us.